Okay, welcome to the um, Closure Web Development Session. Um, my name is Philipp Schiermacher. I'm working for a consultancy called InnoQ. Uh, we've got offices in Switzerland and Germany, and the office I'm working for is located in Monheim, which is um, right in the middle of uh, Cologne and Düsseldorf, so just around the corner. Um, I'm usually working as a software developer on Java projects, but my favorite language is Clojure, so I'm happy I can talk about that today. Um, I'm also a co-founder of the Düsseldorf Closure user group, so if you live in the area and are interested in some, uh, some closure hacking or an occasional talk, uh, you might want to check out our Google group, which you can find here. Um, okay, so much for the advertisement. Um, before we um, have a look at the agenda, what I'd like to know is um, who of you is already a um, Lisp user, so who knows Scheme, Common Lisp, or anything like that? Okay. And who does already know Clojure? Okay, that's nice. Um, anyone who does not know Java at all? That's not a problem. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay, so um, I will first introduce you to some, some Clojure basics. Um, not in very much detail, but just so that everyone can understand the following code examples. And we'll then talk about web development. Um, in Clojure, people don't usually use um, full stack frameworks like, like Rails or Django or pay, um, Play or stuff like that. Um, but instead, there's a couple of um, open source libraries, and one usually picks um, some of these libraries and combines uh, them as is needed for the, for the current project. And so I'll just show you some of these libraries and show you how to use them and combine them efficiently. Um, where there are no full stack frameworks, there are still a couple of micro frameworks which don't really um, add much functionality on top of these libraries, but they help um, combining the libraries and make getting started a bit easier. And I've prepared a small demo application uh, with one of these micro frameworks, which is called Noir, and I will show you that at the end of the talk. Okay, so now let's start with the Clojure basics. Um, Clojure is actually quite a, quite a simple language. Uh, there's only two things that are really important, uh, the first of which are generic data types. So this is an example for a Clojure map literal. Um, it's a bit similar to, to JSON, as you can see, but um, whereas in JSON, um, keys and values are separated by colons, in Clojure, they just alternate. So on the, on the left side, we've got all the keys, and on the right side are the corresponding values. And those things that start with a colon um, are keywords. Um, keywords in Clojure are a bit similar to uh, symbols in Ruby, if you know that. Um, and they are, for various reasons, a pretty good fit for, for keys and hash maps. Uh, one such reason is that they um, are always interned, so it's they can very cheaply be compared for equality. Um, a very um, important uh, collection collection type in Clojure are vectors. Uh, vectors are written with um, square brackets. Uh, so here we can see that Clojure is a functional language for the Java virtual machine. And of course, Clojure is a Lisp, so there's uh, lots of parents. Um, all these uh, data types in Clojure are Java types. So the um, strings one uses in Clojure are just um, normal Java lang strings, and there's also no wrapper classes involved like in languages like, um, like Ruby or, s uh, or JRuby or stuff like that. But you really have direct access to the JVM, and that yeah, makes interop um, pretty easy. Also, all these um, collections implement uh, well known Java interfaces like Java Util Collection or Java Util List, and that uh, these maps and Clojure also implement Java Util Map. So that makes it very easy to call um, Java from Clojure. Okay, so much um, for the data. Of course, we do not only want to define data, we'd also like to uh, work with that data. And for that, we use functions. And using functions is always uh, represented by a list. So um, here we've got a list, um, and the first element of that list is the function plus, and everything that follows after that function are the arguments. So here we just... Um, sum up one and two, and the result is three, of course. And we can also use um, keywords as functions. So here we've got a map with a name um, that um, has 
values for name and city, and if we pass that map to a um, to the city keyword, the corresponding value is looked up. So here we return Monheim. So um, while in Java one would um, create a class, a, a Java bean to hold the data, and then use a getter to access that data. Um, in Clojure, one uses uh, maps to um, to hold the data and then uses keywords to access the data. A very important property of Clojure functions is that they are first class. Uh, first class means that functions um, can be stored in variables like any other value, or they can be passed um, passed around around as arguments to functions, or functions can also return other functions as return values. So here's an example. The map function in um, Clojure um, takes two arguments here. Um, the first argument is a function increment, and the second argument is a collection of, of numbers. And what map does is it applies uh, the increment function to every um, element of that collection and returns a new um, collection with the corresponding result values. OK, so of course, we do not only want to use built-in functions. We'd also like to define our own function. So for example, we'd like to know what to do depending on the weather. So we define a function using def n. Uh, the function is called activity, and it accepts one argument, um, the current weather. And everything that follows after that argument vector is the body of the function that is evaluated to um, generate the result value. So here the body is just an if expression, and we just check if the weather is nice. We can go surfing. Um, otherwise, we have to play PlayStation. Um, OK, so let's have a look at another example for defining a function, which is a higher order function. So we've got a function which is called make adder. Make adder takes one argument x, and it returns another function. Um, so we return an anonymous function, which we define using fn. And the anonymous function we return um, accepts another argument y, and it returns the sum of x and y. So let's have a look at how to use this function. Um, we can apply make adder to the value 2, and that returns a new function which we then, um, to which we then bind the name add2. So here we've got a function add2, and we can apply that function to 3, and it ret uh, returns 5. Any questions so far, or is this, this clear? Great. OK, so much for the, for the closure basics. As you can see, it's really pretty simple. There's just functions and data. And um, so let's have a look at how we can use such a simple language to do web development. Um, what we'd like to have is um, an app that just takes requests and returns responses. Now, if we only have um, functions and data available, uh, the most straightforward way to model this is to represent um, the request and the response using closure maps. And the app itself is just a function of one argument that takes a request as um, its argument and returns a response. And um, in the Clojure ecosystem, there's a library that implements this, um, this basic idea. And that library is called Ring. Now, Ring is really the, uh, the foundation of the entire Clojure web development stack. So let's have a look at the, the Ring library. Um, the Hello World example in Ring looks like this. So um, as I said, the every web app is just is just a function. So we define the Hello World app using def n. It takes one argument, a request, and it returns a response map. And we just say that the status is 200. Um, we're setting the content type header. And the body we, um, of the response we are going to return is just Hello World. And um, a ring specifies um, these keys that are valid in such maps. So it says which values are optional and which are mandatory. OK, and now since Hello World, uh, our Hello World app is just a function, we can apply it um, like any other function. So for example, in a unit test, we can just um, create a request. Um, we can just create a closure map that represents a request and pass that um, request to our function, and it returns the expected result map. Um, now our um, our Hello World app expects uh, the request to be passed in as a closure data structure. So of course we have to define uh, we have to create these closure data structures uh, uh, closure data structures somewhere. So uh, for that Ring uses a set of adapters. Uh, for example, there is a Jetty adapter. Jetty is just a pretty simple Java web server, 
And using the run jetty function, we can um, create an instance of uh, a jetty, jetty web server which listens on port 8080. And whenever an um, a HTTP request comes in, the um, jetty adapter takes that HTTP request, transforms it into a closure map. That closure map is then passed to our Hello World app. The Hello World app creates a uh, closure map that represents the response. And the jetty adapter then writes out that uh, the corresponding HTTP response. OK, so much for the Hello World example. Let's have a look at another example. Assume we'd, um, we'd like to build a home page, so we want to serve some dynamically generated HTML. Again, our home page is just going to be a function that takes a request and it returns a response um, which in its body contains some, some HTML. And as you can see, uh, we are not only serving HTML, but we also include some CSS. So we'd also like to serve um, some static resources. Now, serving static resources is some pretty common functionality, and of course, we don't want to implement that in, in every application we're going to build. So we need some kind of mechanism to reuse such um, common functionality. What we'd like to have is something like this. Whenever a request comes in, we first check if it's a request for a static resource. And if it is, we return the static resource. And otherwise, we pass the request on to our home page and generate that HTML. So one could say that we would like to decorate our home page with the ability to serve static resources. And um, so we're going to use the decorator pattern for that. Now, how do we implement the decorator pattern in a functional language like Clojure? Well, all we can do is define functions. So that's what we're going to do. So we've got a function called decorate. And actually, this example is a bit similar to the make adder um, example we've seen before. So um, the function decorate takes one argument, a web app, which is just a function, and it returns another function. So it uh, returns another web app. And um, the web app that we return actually closes over the web app we're decorating. So what we can do is whenever a request comes in, um, we could just call the web app we're decorating, or we could also modify the request, or we could decide to um, not call the decorated web app at all and just return some response that we'd like to return, or we could also call the web app, take the response, modify that, maybe add some more headers to it, and then return that instead. So let's have a look at how we can serve static resources using this mechanism. So whenever a request comes in, what we do is we just check if it's a request for a static resource. If it is, we return that static resource. And if it's not, then we call the web app we are decorating to handle the request normally. Now, this example is a bit, is a bit simplified. Um, the actual implementation that's included in Ring um, looks roughly like this. So in Ring, these decorators are always called wrap something. So here it's called wrap resource. And the function takes two arguments. The first argument is the web app. These web apps in, uh, in Ring are always called handlers. And the sec uh, second argument is just a string that says where our um, static resources can be found on the class path. And whenever a request comes in, we first check if it's actually a GET request. If it's not a GET request, it can't be a request for a static resource. So if it's, a get, uh, if it's not a GET request, we just pass it um, onto our handler that we are decorating. But if it's a GET request, we check if there is a, um, a static resource on the path um, that matches the request. If there is, we return that static resource. And otherwise, we just, um, again, call our handler that we're decorating. OK, so now let's have a look at how we can apply this handler to our, to our home page. So we're defining our home page as before. And then we create our actual web app by calling the web resource decorator on our home page and also saying that um, the static resources will be available in the public directory on the class path. And we can then again use the jetty adapter to, to run our app. So now let's give this a try to see if it actually works. And we call our web app with a um, request for a static resource, our pretty CSS. Um, and what it returns is indeed a response with a file in its body. So when the Jetty adapter sees such a, such a response with a file um, as its body, what it, what it does is it takes the content of that file and writes it as um, the entity on the HTTP response. 
Okay, so we can serve static resources, <coughs> but it would actually be even better if we could, um, if we'd set some additional headers here. So, for example, we're serving a CSS, some CSS content. So maybe we should say that that the um, content type is application CSS, and we could also say uh, set the the last modified header. So we can have a look at the file and see when it was last changed in the file system, and can then set the ap uh, appropriate HTTP header. So what we'd really like to have is something like this. Um, we add another decorator to our app, and this decorator does not care about requests, but it takes a look at every response we're going to return, and whenever that response returns a file, uh, includes a file, we set some more headers on that. So this is how we can um, apply multiple decorators to our to our app. Once uh, once again, we, we first define the home page. And we then create our web app by using Clojure's arrow operator. So what happens here is we we take the home page and first we call wrap resource on that home page, <coughs> saying that the static resources are found in the public directory. And the result of that is then passed into the wrap file info decorator. And that um, returns our actual web app. So the um, the decorator that we've got at the bottom is actually the outermost um, layer in that onion we're creating. Okay, so if you don't like that arrow operator, of course, you can just use the usual lispy inside out notation to do the same th uh, thing. And once again, we can run it in a jetty. And if we um, now call our web app and um, pass it a request for static resource, we see that not only the static resource is returned, but it also um, sets the um, appropriate headers on the response. So of course, um, serving static resources, just a, a simple example for this general mechanism for reusing common functionality. And this decorator mechanism is used um, quite a lot um, in Ring. So it's, it's also used for doing stuff like uh, session handling, for flash sessions, for, for e-tags. It can be used for, um, for adding basic authentication to a web app. And it's also used for more low-level stuff like um, parsing parameters. So we can use the wrap params uh, decorator to parse the request parameters or form parameters, which are then added um, to the request as a closure map. Um, OK, so let's have a look at where we are so far. We can define these handlers, which um, are our actual web apps. And we can um, add lots of common functionality, which in Ring is called middleware. Um, to our handlers, but the problem is that the handlers we're actually creating are still pretty, pretty basic. Um, so let's have a look at a uh, at another open source library um, which helps us create some more sophisticated handlers and, for example, do routing based on the on the HTTP verb or um, uh, on the URI, URI we pass in. And one library that uh, lets us do just that in Clojure is called Composure. So Composure um, provides two major features. The first of that is a uh, set of macros that correspond to the HTTP verbs. And we can use these macros to create handler functions. Um, what I'll do is I'll first show you a couple of examples for how to use these macros. And we'll then give a basic explanation of what macros actually are so that you can get a basic idea for how stuff like that is implemented in a Lisp. OK, so here we say that we um, would like to have a handler for get requests um, to the to the hello URI and um, that uh, second argument to the get macro is is a vector which we are going to ignore for the moment and everything after that vector is um, what the get macro will create the ring response map from so here we're just creating a hello world re uh, response like before and if we call that get handler with a request um, with a get request for the for the um, hello URI, it returns um, the the response map that we expect. But if we um, use this get handler on a post request, it just returns nil to indicate that it does not know how to handle such a request. And we see why this is important in a couple of slides. Okay, so these URI templates. Um, we are using can also include variables, which are prefixed by a colon. <coughs> so we can have path variables. For example, here we um, we assign this uh, fragment of the URI to the symbol name at uh, runtime. So that's what this vector is used for. 
and we can then use uh, this name to create a nice personal greeting. Uh, well, of course, we cannot only um, create get handlers uh, this way, we can also create post handlers and put and delete and whatever. So um, here we are having a handler for the names resource. It um, accepts one form parameter, a name, which we then store in a database or whatever. So this remember function is, I just made it up. And we then do a redirect to the, to the um, hello resource we defined before. And this uh, redirect function, of course, just creates a closure map that uh, sets a status code 301, so that's how we do redirects. Okay, so um, by using these get and post macros, what we're actually doing is we're defining functions. And that's uh, because get and post are macros, and um, to understand how this works, um, I will explain macros to you. I assume not everyone understands what a macro is because <coughs> there were some people that don't know Lisp, so maybe I should explain this. Um, now macros are um, the Lisp feature for doing metaprogramming and for generating source code. And um, they operate at compilation time, so to understand how they work, let's have a look at the compilation process. In a language like Java, um, compilation looks roughly like this. So we write our source code, which is just some text. We pass that text into the compiler, and the compiler then generates bytecode, which can be executed on the JVM. And as you can see, the compiler is a black box, so we can't really um, influence that process. So if we would like to add a feature to the Java language, all you can do is write an email to, to Oracle and beg them to implement it, and they are probably not going to do it, so we're kind of stuck. But in Lisp, um, this is a bit, dis uh, bit different because um, the pr uh, compilation process is actually split up. So instead of one compiler, we have two components. And the first component is called the reader, and the reader is uh, the component that takes our source code as text, and the reader just parses that um, source code and emits a data structure that represents our source code. And this data structure is then passed into the evaluator, and the evaluator is um, the actual component that generates our bytecode. And we can then execute that bytecode on the JVM. So um, having a look at an example, here we've got an if expression. And we pass that if expression as text into the reader. And during compilation, what happens is, is um, the reader emits a data structure that represents our if expression. So it's just a normal Java util list. The first element of that list is a symbol if. The second element is a Boolean value two. Um, and the third and fourth elements are just normal Java lang strings. And the evaluator then takes this data structure and creates the corresponding bytecode. And the evaluator knows how to do this because enclosure if is some primitive construct. The um, compiler knows a couple of primitive constructs um, and can uh, generate bytecode from these primitives, and it also knows how to call functions and stuff like that. But let's have a look at another example. So here we've got a cont expression. Cont enclosure is pretty similar to switch statement in Java or case in, in Ruby. So we first check if 4 is uh, smaller than 3, which of course is not true, so we don't print wrong, but instead 4 is bigger than 3, so we print yep. And the reader takes this, data uh, this text and it um, produces a data structure, but since cont is not a primitive enclosure, the evaluator does not know how to handle this, this cont um, list. Um, so if cont is not a primitive, and it's also not a function, cont cannot be a function, because if cont were a function, what would happen is that both print statements would um, be evaluated. So we'd always print uh, both strings, and of course, that's not what we'd like to do, so cont cannot be a function. So if cont is neither a primitive nor a function, it has to be th uh, something else, and cont is a macro. So macros are pretty much just also just functions, but they are called during compilation by the compiler, so the evaluator calls the cont macro and passes some arguments to that cont macro, and the arguments it passes to the cont macro are just the content of this list here. So the first argument to the cont macro is the list that checks whether 4 is smaller than 3, and so on. Second argument is the print statement, 
So the quant macro takes uh, these arguments, and what the quant macro does, it, it uh, transforms these data structures and creates a new data structure. And in this case, it just creates a nested if expression. And this nested if expression is then returned to the evaluator, and the evaluator knows if expression, so it can compile the corresponding bytecode from that. Okay, and just for the sake of completeness, this is how we could implement such a, such a macro enclosure. <coughs> Example is a bit simplified, so we only have two uh, conditions and two corresponding expressions. And from these um, data structures, what we create during compilation is just a list. And the first element of that list is the symbol if. We don't want to evaluate that if symbol, so we have to prefix it with a um, quote. So we just create this if expression, and we can then use it and see that it works. Okay, so let's uh, get back to the composure example. Uh, we were writing stuff like this, and when the reader sees such code, what it does is it creates a data structure, and now get is also a macro. So <coughs> the, uh, the compiler during compilation calls the macro, and what the get macro does is it creates a closure function definition. So it creates a list th that represents a closure function definition, and this closure function definition is just just an ordinary handler like the ones we've seen before. So it also takes a request and it then just checks if both the URI of the request and the request method of that request match, and if they do match, it returns a ring response map, and if they don't match, it just returns nil. So that's how by, um, by using these macros, all we're doing is just creating ordinary um, closure handler functions. Okay, so back to composure. This is, these macros are one possibility in Lisp to create a special syntax, um, so one could say that Composure is actually a DSL for creating, uh, um, for creating routes for web apps. Okay, so what we had done was uh, we created this get handler and a post handler. Now, if you'd like to have um, a web app with these two routes, to run this, we'd have to start two Jetty instances, and that's obviously not what we'd like to have, so we need some kind of mechanism to combine several handlers into one, and that's uh, the second major feature of Composure. So as an example, we're going to define an um, application for handling to-do items. So it's a to-do list, and we can have a look at that list, and we can add items to that list and do the usual CRUD stuff. And the app we're going to create is called to-do app, and we define it using cl uh, Composure's dev roots facility. And um, we are, um, want that app to support a certain set of roots, which we are going to define in place. So, for example, one can get all to-dos, so when calling this route, we just look up all the to-dos in the database, render them appropriately as JSON or whatever, and um, create the corresponding responses. It's also possible to load just one specific to-do item by ID. And we can also post new to-do items um, using JSON. Now, um, this construct here is, if you know Clojure, it's just a destructuring form which is um, applied to the request. Um, if you don't know Clojure, we just extract the body from the request. And the body, um, when we send uh, JSON to, a, uh, to a cl uh, such a handler, the um, body of that request is just an, uh, just an input stream. So it's just a, <coughs> a stream of bytes. And on the next line, what we do is we slurp in that input stream. So we just take the input stream and create a string from that. Uh, we then have a JSON string, so we transform that JSON string into a closure data structure using read JSON, and we then create the to-do item in our database or whatever. And after we've done that, we're going to redirect the user to our to-do list. Okay, so of course we do not only want to um, list to-do items and create new um, to-dos, we'd also like to um, we'd also like to modify existing um, to-do items or delete items, so let's define some more routes. Now, deleting and updating to-do items um, uh, both uses uh, the same URI template, so we can use the context macro to abbreviate this a bit. So we're just saying that um, we can delete items by passing in an ID. Uh, we then delete that to-do item from our database and redirect the user or when updating a to-do item, we also take um, the, the new item as JSON, pass 
uh, that JSON, like before, update the corresponding to-do item in our database and also perform a redirect. Now, what's nice about Composure is that everything uh, composes quite nicely. So we can create our complete app by just um, combining the, the routes we've defined before. Okay, actually, I uh, forgot to mention one of the most important things. Uh, what actually happens when uh, such a handler is called, so when the to-do app is just it's just going to be a normal function. And when that function is, um, is called, so when a request is comes in, what actually happens is um, DevRoots first applies the first um, route to that, um, to that request. And if that, uh, the first handler returns a ring response, um, that ring response is going to be the response of our web app. But if, that ha if the first handler returns nil, it's going to attempt to apply the next, the next handler. So it just goes through all these handlers, and if it finds one that does not return nil, it returns that response. Otherwise, the response is just nil. And what happens here is just when someone calls the complete app, all our routes are being um, applied, and if none of them matches, we just um, apply this, this handler, which we obtain by calling not found. So it's just a handler that takes a request, a request and whatever that is, it returns a 404 response. So this is how we can create a complete app. Now, if you want to um, make this app secure, we can also add basic authentication to that, uh, to that app by reusing this, um, this decorator. So as be uh, before, we are decorating our app. And we um, use this decorator and pass in a function which we have to define. Allowed is just a function that takes two arguments, a username and a password, and it then figures out if that combination is valid. If it is valid, it calls the complete app with our request. And if it's not valid, it just returns a 401 or whatever response. So we can then run this complete app in a Jetty adapter as before. We're also using the API method from Composure to, some, uh, to apply some more middleware. It's just some, some um, default stuff like, for example, parsing parameters and common functionality like that. OK, so by doing this, we can create a complete application rather quickly. So let's have a look where we are so far. We can create handlers, which can do uh, routing. We can um, decorate these handlers with common functionality. We also have seen how to handle JSON input. But what we've not seen so far is how to generate HTML. And that's also quite, a, quite an important feature of most uh, web applications. So let's have a look at how we can generate HTML in Clojure. Now, since Clojure is running on the, on the JVM, we can just reuse most of the um, template engines on the JVM, like um, FreeMarker or a String Template or Apache Velocity and stuff like that. But there are also a set of libraries that are more idiomatic for Clojure and let us cr um, create HTML using usual Clojure mechanisms, so it's just functions and data. And one of uh, these libraries I actually like very much is called Hiccup, so I'm going to show you that one. Now, Hiccup is pretty simple. With Hiccup, when, um, when generating HTML, the basic idea is to just represent that um, HTML using a closure data structure. So specifically, we're going to use vectors to represent HTML. And the first element of um, the vector is going to be an a keyword which represents the, the element name. After that keyword, we have an optional map for the, for the attributes of our element. And after that map, we have um, all the nested elements of our, um, of our element. So here it's just a nested, a nested vector with a value bar. So that's how we represent HTML. Now, how do we um, create HTML strings from these vectors? Here we um, just have a small HTML snippet. And um, we represent this HTML snippet using a closure vector, as you can see. And we then can just use the HTML function from, from Hiccup, pass in that vector, and uh, this generates the HTML we'd like to have. So that's a complete round trip. Um, now let's have an example at how one usually works when uh, with Hiccup. So um, let's assume we've got data about people. So we've got a person called Paul. Um, Paul has a name and an age. 
and we'd like to generate some HTML to represent Paul. So we're going to define a function render person. Render person takes one argument, and from that argument, it creates a closure vector that represents the HTML. So here we just have a definition list for name and age. And when calling uh, that render person function on, on Paul and then passing the resulting vector into, into the HTML function, we um, can create the, the HTML string that we'd like to have. Okay, um, so that's how one works with Hiccup, just um, calling functions on generic data, uh, data types. And Hiccup also includes a set of functions uh, for commonly used functionality. For example, um, if uh, one would like to create a, a link element, one can uh, use the link to function, just pass in the URI and a some element um, to represent the, the link element. And Hiccup returns a appropriate vector. And there's also utility functions for um, creating form elements. So here we're just creating some, some input form, some, uh, some, some login form using form2 and a couple of functions to generate, to generate input elements. And that returns a, a vector which um, represents a form element and uh, has a couple of attributes and some, some inputs. OK, so one last slide for Hiccup. Um, one pretty often has to define um, elements with IDs and CSS classes, and for that, there is a shortcut in Hiccup, so we can just um, append um, to, the, to the element name a hash um, to define an ID, and then add some CSS classes, which are separated by colons. So here we just create a diff with an ID and two CSS classes. Okay, so much for for generating HTML, now we are almost done. We can, we can create web applications in Clojure. We can define handlers that can do routing, that can accept JSON, that can emit HTML. We can reuse common functionality through Ring's middleware mechanism. And we've already seen the, the Jetty adapter to um, connect our applications to a network. Of course, there are also other adapters. For example, there's also a servlet adapter included in the Ring library. And um, this servlet adapters, servlets are the Java standard mechanism for handling HTTP. So uh, this servlet adapter is also just, just a servlet, and whenever a request comes in, it creates a corresponding uh, re uh, request map, passes that to the handler, the re handler returns a response, and, it, and the servlet adapter creates an HTTP response from that closure map. And by using this um, servlet adapter, we can generate servlets and just normal WAR files uh, using Clojure. So um, what this allows us to do is to reuse all this um, pretty uh, popular Java infrastructure. So Tomcats, Jetties, Glassfish servers, all that stuff can be, can be used to deploy Clojure web applications. Uh, so that makes it pretty easy to, to de uh, deploy this stuff in uh, usual enterprise companies, enterprises. OK. so. Um, Far we've seen how to, um, how to build web applications in Clojure, and for that we've just used a set of open source libraries. Now, especially when starting out, building web apps in Clojure it's a bit, um, can be a bit daunting because you have to know which libraries to use and how to combine them uh, efficiently. So, especially when uh, just getting started, it's, it's nice to have some micro-framework that um, helps with that. And one example for such a micro-framework is called Noir. Now, Noir does not really add very much functionality on top of these libraries, but it makes integrating them a lot easier. So using Noir, um, it's very easy to use Ring, Composure, and Hiccup. For defining routes in Noir, there is a facility called DevPage. And when using that, um, Noir also adds um, some, some default middleware, um, for example, parsing parameters, um, serving static resources, a default 404 page, and all that low-level stuff is already taken care of by the framework. But under the hood, it uses exactly these mechanisms that we've seen so far. Noir also includes a set of handlers for common stuff like validating form elements. And uh, what's also pretty nice on the JVM is that when building web apps with Noir, uh, Noir it automatically um, reloads the source code when it's uh, running in dev mode. So whenever you 
change your source file on disk, it automatically um, reloads the source code so that it's available when the next, re next request comes in so you don't have to restart your, your web server all the time. Okay, and as I said, I've prepared a small demo application um, with Noir, and I'd just like to show you that. Now I had to set the resolution to 800, 600, so it's quite low, uh, but I hope you can see everything. Now when building Clojure apps, there is a pretty um, popular um, build tool, which is called Liningen. Liningen and Clojure is pretty similar to, or roughly corresponds to tools like Maven in the Java world. <coughs> and when building Liningen projects, um, one usually has a file which is called project CLJ. And that file project CLJ just describes the project, so it's similar to a POM file in Maven. So here we just say that um, we've got a couple of dependencies. So we're using Clojure 130. We are also using Noir. We are using Korma to generate um, SQL statements and some other stuff. And we also say that the the main function of our application is defined in the Noir demo server um, namespace. So by running uh, by using line run, we can call this main function, and what it does is it just um, uh, it just creates a Jetty instance and runs our app. So let's have a look. We s start a JVM, which takes a second, and now we've got our app running on port 8080. Oh yeah, and I I'll try to increase the resolution. Okay, hope it stays like that. So it's quite a simple application. We just got a to-do list, and um, so we've got a list of to-do items. We can also add new items to this list. And when we add that item, it also uh, appears in our list. We can also search this list. So of course, we're only interested in closure stuff. So um, now we only got the closure items. Uh, we can also change or delete stuff, so I'm just going to delete this and it disappears from the list. Okay, so very basic basic application. Um, now let's have a look at the directory structure. Um, with line, lining and applications, the source code is always defined in a directory called source. So let's have a look at that. and. As I said, closure functions are always defined in namespaces, and namespaces are defined in files, and these files are organized in a, data st uh, in a directory structure that represents the names da uh, namespace structure. So we, our application has one top-level namespace, Noir Demo, and in that namespace we have um, the models namespace and one namespace for the views, and since the application is pretty simple, we have only one entity to do, so there's only one uh, model namespace, and there's also a um, corresponding to-do namespace um, in the views uh, in the views namespace, and we also have some common view functionality. So let's just have a quick look um, how this looks like. So the front page is accessible under this URI. So we've got to define a corresponding root somewhere, and as I said, in in Noir, roots are defined using dev page. So we just say that at this URI um, we can access our front page. There is an optional search parameter which we can pass in. If such a search is given, we lo only um, load the corresponding to-do items from the database and render them on the on the to-do page on the front page. <coughs> and if no search is given, we just render all items. And once again, it's all just functions and data, so um, to-do page is also just an ordinary function. And it's actually overloaded on arity, so the if we call it with just a list of to-dos, it redirects to this implementation that takes three arguments. So here we have all the stuff we need to render our front page, because if I enter, so enter some invalid item, I'd also like to, uh, to render an error message and to keep the information the user already entered, and for that we need these additional arguments. So we have a list of to-dos, we've got the errors, and we've got the input the user already entered, and from that we're just going to create a closure vector which 
represents the HTML we'd like to return. And we so here we just create a a diff element and we wrap that diff into our common layout. And the layout is also just a function, so let's have a look at that as well. It's defined in the in the common namespace. So here we've uh, we've got our navbar, which we can see up here, and we we uh, we've also got this this layout function. The layout function just takes some content, and from that content it um, creates the um, HTML string using HTML, uh, the HTML5 function. Okay, so that's basically it. That's just how one can build a basic um, web application in Clojure. And um, yeah, that's how to use how to use Noir. It's pretty easy to get started, so I suggest you just have a look at their website. Okay, so I'm almost done. Um, actually, it's just bit less than one hour. I just noticed. So um, yeah, we've seen we've seen Noir. Okay, um, and with that, I'm done. So. Let's have a look at the conclusion. Of course, it's pretty awesome. Uh, the basic concepts are uh, are very simple, and that's uh, I think that's a very good uh, thing. So if you if you know these Ritchicky talks, and if you don't know them, you should know them. Um, it's it's very it, uh, simple in the Ritchicky sense, but it's also very very easy to use. So especially with a with a micro framework like Noir, um, it's very easy to get started. And there's very little code one has to write, but not only the the application one creates is pretty small, so that to-do application I wrote is just like 300 lines of code, code or something like that. Um, but also the, the libraries themselves are just incredibly tiny compared to everything I've seen in Java. So um, it, that makes it very easy to, to actually understand what's, what's going on. And if you have a problem, you can just dive into the source code and have a look how it works. That really helps. And it's also pretty easy to extend these, these libraries. And what's also great is, and that's actually not too common for Lisp uh, stuff, it, that it's actually being used for um, production by lots of people. Uh, so there's a very uh, active and helpful community. Um, so if you have any problems creating your applications, it's usually very easy to find someone who's already solved these problems for you. So um, by just checking out some Google groups and asking or checking out Stack Overflow and the usual sources, um, it's usually possible to, to find some help. And since uh, Clojure is running on the JVM, um, there's although that Clojure is uh, very new, there's still a very mature ecosystem one can one can use. So there's lots of uh, web servers, and it's easy to access databases and all that stuff. Because um, for all these these tasks, there are Java libraries which have been used in production for ages, and you can just reuse all that stuff. And at least for production systems, it's good to have mature stuff. So that's also quite quite a nice nice thing. And with that. I'm done, so thank you. <laughs> and I think we still got some, some time for questions, so yes. Uh, manipulating vectors is actually pretty easy because they allow random access to the elements, and yeah, it's it's pretty common in Clojure to use um, to use vectors for application data. So one rarely uses lists for that. For that, lists are basically uh, mainly used for for representing source code, but for application data, um, vectors are the first choice in Clojure usually. Um, I'm only aware of a couple of applications that um, use Clojure for their web layer, but um, they might have other stuff in the back end. Um, there are certainly a um, couple of um, smaller projects that use it for their entire stack. I think, I'm not sure what Do uses. I think you guys use Clojure as well. Do you use it for the entire stack or just? So all closure. Sounds awesome. Yeah, they do it. 
<laughs> okay, any more questions? Yeah, please. Awesome. Um, it's <laughs> uh, it's um, the um, performance you can expect is like with any um, uh, servlet application in Java. So it's it doesn't. Add, I don't really have any numbers. So um, it's uh, it doesn't add very much complexity on on top of just servlets. So it's um, pretty much as fast as you can get with uh, servlets. But of course, it's a synchronous approach to creating web applications. So if you have I don't know like more than 10,000 concurrent uh, connections, you probably want to choose something different, but for normal synchronous applications, I think the performance should be pretty good. Yeah, you can use it. Uh, it's called ALEPH, A-L-E-P-H, and that allows one to use an, an, an asynchronous server to launch these applications. Any more questions? Um, I didn't quite understand. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, it's we are um, having a look at that quite, quite often, and also use it for some small stuff. And we're also hiring, by the way, but <laughs> you know that. Okay, so any more questions, or are we? So I guess we're done. Thank you.